Don in London, hello. June 20th, my video is all about recovery from addiction to either substance or behaviour. My addictive substance, alcohol, my behaviour, equally addictive around trying to be perfect, in the right place, with the right people, doing the right things and having the right things. Always trying to be whatever I thought I ought to be, or maybe what I thought you wanted me to be. So, from heavy drinker to dependent drinker to alcoholic. It didn't take long in the end to get to a place of addiction and I guess the first drink did do the damage. My first drink when I was very very young changed the way I felt and it fixed me. It pushed away the fear and introduced happiness or so I thought. At least sleepiness or just being out of it. Fixing myself. And of course I didn't realise I was doing it, once I'd got that first taste for it, that life could be okay if I just suppress my feelings and let, let life happen with a different outlook than the one I would normally have, which meant that I never really dealt with my feelings daily, or I took the edge off them. So these days I don't. And what I've learned is the more I deal with my feelings as they are in the moment, the better life can be. So what helped me get out of addiction? Well, family, friends, community, medical people, all kept me alive, thank goodness. And then I came to a fellowship called Alcoholics Anonymous and it helped me even more. So I don't speak for AA, Alcoholics Anonymous is full of unique, authentic people who share their experience, strength and hope where they will. And the reason for me doing these videos is to help share experience, strength and hope and know that there is more than one way to get out of the daily addiction process to substance or behaviour. And it's the many voices in recovery which absolutely count. One voice is never enough. Indeed, we need to lean on the greater number in order that we can carry, be carried along into a sober way of life. If we lean too heavily on one person, as many will experience in relationships, we tend to bring the person down or they will leave us, quite rightly, because we're just unmanageable, we're just totally and personally unmanageable in life. And probably highly controlling, manipulative, all those things. Some people say it's even called sneaky. And I think that was me, although I didn't even know I was really being sneaky until somebody pointed it out. So one day at a time, sober is preferred by me, and in these videos, what follows on from this uh, particular sharing is the step six, no, step six, the AA daily reflection for today, and some more about experience, strength and hope over the years, and a reading of step six from the 12 steps and 12 traditions. So just for today though, uh, June 20th, uh, the sun's just come out, here in London, UK. Yeah, step six, which is where I focus every June, sixth month, sixth step, all about defects of character and how they impact on our daily life. Fear, putting on a brave face and ego rising in the moment happens when we are challenged in our outlook and behaviour. So if ever I get challenged, and this happened yesterday, I shudder sometimes at what I've done in the past, the way life was when I was addicted to alcohol and addicted to the behaviour that went with it. I do shudder at what happened and the impact I had on other people. Yeah, we, we feel challenged in our outlook and behaviour. I do need to take account of how I behave and the impact it has on those I love and encounter today. Seeing the situation through the eyes of those around me is so important or I lose sight of the bigger picture. It's not all about me. Indeed, life is hardly ever about me in the big picture. But I'm still here, uh, not kicking and screaming into it each, each next moment, but actually accepting where I am. What is my part? What is my contribution? How am I included? I don't actually think those consciously, but that's what's at the back of my mind. So I have a life to live and it's uh, all about how to love, be loved back and useful. And I have many interests these days which have nothing to do with my drinking days. One is staying sober primarily 
and then seeing how life can develop. And secondly, these are my thoughts I put out there on YouTube and in other forums as well. I need to remind myself, when I encounter difficult people and loved ones, because they can be difficult too, as can I, what feels like the worst for me is them being the best they can be in that moment. So even though a person may be, it feels like their worst is being done to me, actually it's not, it's the best they can be right now. And the reason why I might feel less than, awkward, is something that maybe I have done in the past, which has evoked those comments and feelings. So it's not for them to modify their behaviour, it's, it's for me to adjust to understand why it is the way it is. So when we understand why it is the way it is, when we encounter people at their worst, or behaving in a fashion which feels like the worst for us, we need to ask ourselves, well, what provoked that? And often it may be something we have done in the past, or they have been provoked beyond the pale by situations they have encountered recently, which make them feel fearful, putting on a brave face, and their ego rising up to defend that person inside. Our worst might be the best in that moment. Forgive everyone everything. An open heart will lead to peace and serenity. And this idea of forgiving everyone everything, I need to do it. Because if I bear a grudge and a resentment or have anger stirring in me constantly over a particular situation, person, place or thing, if I keep that anger, resentment going, it's making my whole life darker than it need be. So what is peace and serenity? Well, for me, peace and serenity is being able to deal with real life as it is. So let people be the way they are. It's not for me to control or fashion people into what I think they ought to be. They will get along nicely without me, learning life as I do. But I had a lot of help learning how to live my life, free of shame, and those shuddering moments often, which came to me pr pretty much every day when I couldn't stop drinking. So to be re reminded by the, I suppose, infrequent shadow these days of how I used to be and what it meant and how I behaved, it really does take me back. And uh, I do feel shame sometimes and guilt and wish I'd done it differently, but now I know how to and that's the biggest gift of sobriety for me. Other words which came through the years, <coughs> released from fear daily. A universal meditation to God or to good conscience, depending on your belief system, for me is the serenity prayer. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. So what I can and cannot do today, what I can do to the good, what I cannot do, can't change anybody else really in terms of their attitude and behaviour. I might do on a temporary basis, but it might flick straight back to where it was once I've gone. And that means it's not real, really. They're just pretending to be okay with me. Every time we say the serenity prayer, we find our choices in the moment of now. And that's the choice to let people be often, be the best they can be, even when it feels the worst. Or say, ouch, that, that's hurtful. But the reason why it's hurting me is because of the way I used to be and uh, a shuddering reminder is not a bad thing. And then finally on this one, success and failure may be imposters. Do we measure up? If we're continually measuring ourselves in some way or form, in an unhelpful, logical, theoretical way, we continue to live our lives in a theoretical way too, always trying to work out what is the right way to be, rather than just to be ourselves, and keep on learning how to be ourselves. Our emotional and spiritual balance in the now depends on how we cherish ourselves and others, or how we may be superficial and indifferent. Cherish, the word cherish, superficiality, indifference. Seeing good measures to progress a day at a time, and because it's about feelings mainly, so the more I forgive, either myself for my indiscretions or past behaviour, somehow I need to do that in order to keep on learning new ways to behave and improve 
my cherishing of the world and everybody in it and it doesn't mean I need you to cherish me but it sure is nice if you do another part is superficiality and indifference if I treat people superficially or with indifference I will get the same back not because I'm intending to be superficial or indifferent in the past I just didn't, didn't know how to be any other way so the more we express our feelings to others about how we feel about situations the more maybe they can express their feelings in an open honest way but of course the defects of character come out big time extremes of fear not being able to fit in or not good enough or thinking you're too good enough or fearless completely fearless without uh, any reason to be that way if it doesn't have uh, some sort of basis in reality we're out of sync enough of me today and uh, you know there are shuddering moments where maybe things were done harshly to me but also I did harsh things to other people by being superficial and indifferent and especially under the influence of addiction not even knowing I was doing it ignorance is not bliss in recovery but understanding helps find peace and serenity enough for today Don in London, hello. My daily video about recovery from addiction to either substance or behaviour. My addictive substance, alcohol, my behaviour equally addictive to people, places, things, work and relationships. Trying to fix myself, probably living at, at extremes, trying to feel right about life, never so. So, daily reflections for June 20th in this book, a little bit of wisdom to share words from another person we need to hear many voices to get the right blend which works works for us release from fear the problem of resolving fear has two aspects we shall have to try for all the freedom from fear that is possible for us to attain then we shall need to find both the courage and grace to deal constructively with whatever fears remain and it's getting fear right sized to the event that is happening and not extreme fear for prolonged periods like I experienced fear of being found out fear of life and it goes on to say most of my decisions were based on fear alcohol made life easier to face but the time came when alcohol was no longer an alternative to fear one of the greatest gifts AA for me has been the, the courage to take action which I can do with God's help and for me God is truth, God is love and God works through others so I get wisdom from others after five years of sobriety I had to deal with a heavy dose of fear God put the people in my life to help me do that and through work, my working the twelve steps I am becoming the whole person I wish to be and for that I am deep, deeply grateful and I think I've already done that just a second I haven't done it before it's just the ending is different anyway at the end of my videos what do I say the serenity prayer to God or good conscience God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot do which is make a video without making mistakes courage to do the things I can which is continue anyway and the wisdom to know the difference is it doesn't matter as long as I get a message of experience hope and strength in whatever order across just for today Don in London hello it's June 20th 2009 my videos all about recovery from addiction addiction to either substance or behavior and my substance was alcohol my behavior workaholic relationshipaholic Jimaholic, you name it, any old Olic. And it's interesting that we can go from one addiction to another or combine them all together and become completely self obsessed, isolated, and thinking the world is doing something to us which it's not. Simply, addiction really does make us have a very, very, very difficult outlook. 
and what I've learned over recent years is how to keep sober one day at a time and then not cross addict into other behaviour which could be workaholic, gymaholic, relationshipaholic or actually just find the balance of how life may work the balance of life, I guess that's really my theme always the balance of life and uh, what helps me most? family, community, society, medical people and a fellowship, fellowship of AA, Alcoholics Anonymous so what I've learned is uh, keep sober and the rest we can sort out and get to active choices rather than being self-obsessed shut down and only one purpose in life which is to drink so from uh, not drinking these days from a place of drinking every day 24-7 unable to stop life so bad I wanted never to wake up on a daily basis that's where it took me and I need to remind myself of that quite often so the best way for me is to go to fellowship meetings and at each meeting we'll find people there maybe from one hour sober or not quite sober through to decades sober and the difference in outlook is simply what we learn a day at a time so it's accumulated wisdom over the years I guess and the, the first few days are the worst because we have the compulsion, the craving and the absolute agony of not being able to self-medicate into oblivion and I did that for a long time and I didn't even know I was really an alcoholic until I admitted it and accepted it and I knew I know when the 24 7 drinking started around about 2001 2002 but before that the warning signs were there and I couldn't heed them because it meant that I was less than anybody else because I had an addiction so these days I recognize the addiction and the addictive behavior either substance or behavior that's it and I try and make the best of what I have trying to keep sober or living sober is a better way of putting it and expressing it but there is a, a preamble shared at every AA meeting which helps me slow down into the moment and whether we're uh, a newcomer to the fellowship or an old timer I'm not one of those yet although in some places I probably am but uh, the preamble shared at every meeting goes like this and it reminds us what it's all about Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help other alcoholics to achieve to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organisation does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. So one primary purpose, just sobriety, so that we can get our life choices back. And I used to write lots of diaries and stick them on the internet and they're still out there somewhere. And I've been experimenting with the uh, extranormal.com where you can put text in and you get a little cartoon character expressing words so the words are mine the character you need not look at but I find it very fascinating what technology will do and for the princely sum of I don't know just a few pennies a day we can make anything from script into a movie so I'm extremely pleased about that it's an experiment and some of it may be useful or it may not be I don't know yet I'll see how it goes but the gift is keeping on track keeping sober so I can experiment and yesterday my five day course finished which was all about how to manage or live with type 1 diabetes and I met some very good people who were uh, from 30 years dealing with type 1 diabetes through to me two or three years I think nearly four well whatever number of years it is we all learned from day one and by, by day five the, the whole process gave us something which was almost immeasurable how on earth could we have got all that wisdom over the years to just get where we are and then find that we can get even more wisdom in a very comprehensive and quite intensive five day program and the answer is we all got a lot out of it and <clears throat> if I manage my diabetes better my overall outlook could be better <coughs> and oops, dropping my book
all fingers and thumbs this morning. I'm still tired out by the experience. I haven't done any intensive learning like that for quite a long time, other than going to AA meetings, of course, and looking around and seeing what the world has to offer. So, yeah, I'm very pleased. And uh, although I might be tired and fatigued, that's not the issue. The issue is I've got some more learning, and it means that maybe I'll extend my life a little bit more. Because believe you me, even though I thought I knew how to manage my type 1 diabetes or live with it, I've found even more out. And um, I think we were all quite surprised just what we could do. And part of the program was eat what you like. And as a type 1 diabetic, we always thought we couldn't eat sugar, couldn't do this, couldn't do that. But again, it comes down to moderation and knowing the insulin does work if we use the appropriate things with it, carbohydrates in the right measure and then we can keep our blood sugars under control to avoid stroke, heart attack or limbs being taken off because they don't work anymore. And that's quite serious, it's true, but um, I'm gambling, I'm rambling, I'm rambling on here. Daily reflections for today and um, you know I really am pleased that I did this, this course, it's made a huge difference to my confidence to manage the type 1 diabetes. Oh, irony, release from fear. <clears throat> this is what it says, June 20th, one page day, here we go. The problem of resolving fear has two aspects. We shall have to try for all the freedom from fear that is possible for us to attain. Then we shall need to find both the courage and grace to deal constructively with whatever fears remain. Most of my decisions were based on fear. Alcohol made life easier to face, but the, as, but the time came when alcohol no, was no longer an alternative to fear. One of the greatest gifts in AA for me has been, a, been cur the courage to take action, which I can do with God's help. After five years of sobriety, I had to deal with a heavy dose of fear. God put the people in my life to help me do that, and through my working the 12 steps, I am becoming the whole person I wish to be, and for that I am deep, deeply grateful. I could almost have written that about me, and you know, five years in, I get a course on how to deal with my type 1 diabetes, not caused by lifestyle, I hasten to add, it was a virus. Most people get type 1 in their 20s, and I was nearly 50. So the gift is we keep on learning. And, you know, whether you believe in God or good conscience or a higher power, which looks like a chair leg or a, a, a lamp post, doesn't matter. It matters. What matters is we're not God. What matters is we have a good conscience. What matter, matters is faith, courage, and being able to live in the moment. So all the higher powers around me are in the universe, and uh, there must be purpose behind it all. After all, what else would, there be, be, would be the point? And uh, I've always I've been there too. Uh, as Bill sees it, another day at a time. Page 132, spot checking. A spot check inventory taken in the midst of dis disturbances can be of re very great help in quieting stormy emotions. Today's spot check finds its chief application to situations which arise in each day's march. The consideration of long-standing difficulties had better, had better be postponed, when possible, to time deliberately set aside for that purpose. The quick inventory is aimed at our daily ups and downs, especially those, those where people or new events throw us off balance and tempt us to make mistakes. And that would, could have been me. I was frightened to go on this course. I went. I learned more than I could imagine. So the serenity prayer, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the th things I can, with a lot of help in this case, and the wisdom to know the difference. And it is always just for today. Don in London, good morning, and it's June 20th, 2008, and uh, the time around about half past seven. And uh, I was mentioning anonymity yesterday, and I, I go to a fellowship called Alcoholics Anonymous, so anonymity has a special part to play in my life, to a degree, and also is considered to be the spiritual foundation of the fellowship of AA. And I'll just read out the preamble, which probably gives you a bit of a clue to what we do at meetings. Every meeting starts with this, or every meeting I ever go to. And it says, Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength and hope with each other. 
that they may solve their common problem and help, help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization or institution. Does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. And I guess with that in mind I do these videos. And uh, it's a struggle really getting a balance between uh, what is anonymous about uh, or anonymity, what is it about, and how can it be the spiritual foundation of, of a fellowship. And I've puzzled over it for four years because that's as long as I've been a regular attender, nearly every day for four years, now in year five. So there is a conundrum that we all face. We need anonymity, I feel, to find sanctuary so we can find our truth. And I've always believed actually that uh, truth is the spiritual foundation of living and I don't know how an anonymity might serve that badly because I feel that we need a safe place to find truth open honest truth willingness to deal with life as it is and uh, work out where our denials of life are and where our filters about real life are and of course drink and addiction or addiction and drink, both, thi both things are pretty much the same, although there are differences in how different substances and behaviour affect our behaviour. So it's a complicated issue, and the original tenet, if you like, for anonymity was, was a safe place to find out who we were, get our identity back, and uh, make life work again. And there were so many social stigmas attached to uh, being an alcoholic, and still are for many people, because we can be looked down on and judged and actually most people do look down and judge alcoholics as uh, I suppose weak minded individuals what they don't realize is most alcoholics have a willpower beyond reason uh, driven to an insanity to keep on doing something which is madness so in a way we are a strange breed we cannot stop doing something which is self, self harming so anonymity for me is a sanctuary to find the truth the truth of me <coughs> and I've long since given up the idea that I need to be anonymous simply because most people in my community uh, around Chelsea in London know exactly who I am and what I'm doing on a daily basis and that's staying in recovery and trying to make life work one day at a time and you know there's great joy and freedom in letting go anything which gets in the way and what could get in the way of me having the right relationships with people is pretending to be something I'm not. So I am approaching something called normal most of the time, although clinical depression hits me, and that's another bugbear. And I also have to deal with type 1 diabetes, so it's better that I wear a chain around my neck often, which says uh, type 1 diabetic, allergic to alcohol, and maybe I'll feel they have clinical depression as well. Then that these people know if I drop down in the street with a, a, a low blood sugar incident, they know what to do, and that's not to give me alcohol, and to call an ambulance urgently to get me to hospital, and then they can sort me out there. So I wonder how much does anonymity matter to me and the fellowship? And the, the actual truth of that, it is a primary way of finding how to find our truth. So sanctuary in the fellowship. I feel that uh, anonymity is a sanctuary to find the truth, and truth is spiritual. And that really comes back to some basic concepts of uh, how life works best for anyone, and that surely is without filters and denials, or having to hide myself from other people because of the stigma they may judge. So, where am I with this? I've read the leaflets on anonymity and why it's so important that uh, we don't try and build ourselves up to be something we're not or to be an expert or professional in recovery because actually anybody in recovery knows it's one day long you don't get bigger or smaller than anybody else's uh, recovery you just carry on doing your own recovery and we learn the wisdom along the way to make it work for us so we have good choices and all these things are very good with a, a fellowship but it can be a bit t tormenting really this this subject of anonymity and it's not about me being bit bigger or better it's about sharing a message and that's what it's about for me the 12th step 
sharing the message that recovery can work and we get our personal choices back and we don't have to be dogmatic and we don't have to be in a cult to do it because some people think AA might be that it's just a bunch of drugs, how can it be a cult? actually it's recovering alcoholics or recovering drugs coming on to the readings daily reflections June 20th release from fear finding the truth releases me from fear the problem with resolving fear has two aspects. We shall have to try for all, all the freedom from fear that is, is possible it is possible for us to attain. And then we shall f need to find both the courage and grace to deal constructively with what fe whatever fears remain. It goes on to say, most of my decisions were based on fear. Alcohol made life easier to face, but the time came when alcohol was no longer an alternative to fear. One of the greatest gifts in AA for me has been the courage to take action, which I can do with God's help, or with good conscience in my case. After five years of sobriety, I had to deal with a heavy dose of fear. God put the people in my life to help me do that, and through my working the 12 steps, I am becoming the whole person. I wish to be uh, the person I wish to be. For that, I am deep, deeply grateful. And, you know, we find our way, as we do, and every, everybody's idea of God, good conscience, is their own and I need not impose yours on me and uh, you need not impose yours on me either rather I need not impose my ideas on you you can just take them or leave them that's the beauty of uh, fellowship we get our choices back page 175 of this book as Bill sees it nice book actually and it's full of wisdom aspects of tolerance all kinds of people have found their way into AA not, not too long ago I sat talking in my office with a member who bears the title of Countess. That same night I went to an AA meeting. It was winter and there was a, there was a mild looking little gent taking the coats and I said, who's that? And somebody answered, oh he's been around for a long time. Everybody likes him. He used to be one of the homes mob. That's how universal AA is today. So from high, high status to no status, I guess. And that's a gift really, because everybody is equal. Uh, it, people would only be unequal in the eyes of people who judge and uh, I think most people in AA are so long since trying to judge other people just get on with what's going on for them but it goes on to say we have no desire to convince anyone that this is the only way by which faith can be acquired all of us, whatever our race, creed or colour are the children of the living creator with whom we may form a relationship upon simple and understandable terms as soon as we are willing to be honest to try and you know, honestly to try that's all it's asking. So I don't feel too unhappy about you know, what does anonymity mean to me, I mean sanctuary, what does spiritual mean to me. The spiritual foundation of life is truth. And uh, June 20th from this book. And don't forget, it's my opinion, not AA. I'm not a leader in AA, I'm just another average Joe Billy. I am average. Because we all have these thoughts and feelings. June 20th. You should be ready and willing to carry the AA message when called upon to do so. Live for some purpose greater than yourself. Each day, each day you will have something to work for. You have received so much from this program that you should have a vision that gives you your life, gives your life a direction and a purpose that gives meaning to each new day. Let us not slide along through life. Let us have a purpose for each day. And let us make that purpose for something greater than ourselves, just ourselves. What is my purpose today? Sharing the message. And uh, the gift of this really is just to reassure people that um, AA isn't a cult. It's not full of dogma. It can be if you want to be dogmatic. And it's down to the individual who is dogmatic or not. And if you like cults, then you can probably make AA, AA a cult in your eyes, but not in mine. So there we are. Time is up. Uh, more later. Thank you. Don in London, hello. My video is all about recovery from addiction to either substance or behaviour. My addictive substance, alcohol, my behaviour equally addictive around people, places and things. So these days, sober one day at a time. And that's what seems to work. Live in the day, live in the moment. Find my spiritual connection to living in the, in the moment of now. Spiritual life is real life. Everything is spiritual. 
So all those 35 years of drinking were spiritual and what follows on one day at a time is also spiritual. I suppose really the question is for anyone, what quality of spiritual do we enjoy best? And only a person can make up their own mind what is best for them. So I share about what helped me into recovery and to be sober one day at a time with the help and aid of fellowship that fellowship is AA and today I just want to read from this book 12 Steps and 12 Traditions which is the backbone I guess of much of what the fellowship is about 12 steps so we can live well open, honest and willing and the 12 traditions in fellowship, unity, service and recovery sounds like the dog downstairs is not having a good time so what is AA? I just share off the preamble which is on this little card which explains to anyone what the fellowship is there to do to include people around being sober one day at a time and living a spiritual life knowing what our feelings are and not drinking so what is AA? Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organisation or institution. Does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. So it's all about being included. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. And what you make of your life with the help of fellowship and the 12 steps and the 12 traditions and the big book of AA and how you come to live life is as it works for you as an individual because we are all unique and authentic on our life path as we are. So we try not to tell each other what to do. But there are some principles involved, and the principles in the 12 steps and 12 tradi traditions help us to find a sober life. And uh, June, for me, is all about step six. So I share the step. And also a commentary about how it works for me. And step six, it says here, we were ready or rather were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. So what are defects and what are assets or what are our liabilities and what are our assets? It probably boils down to the, in the biblical sense, the seven, si deadly, seven deadly sins and also the seven virtues, the opposite. And if you look on the internet you'll find many a version and here's just a version which I picked up quite quickly right so pride is excessive belief in one's own abilities that interferes with the individual's recognition of the grace of God it has been called the sin from which all others arise pride is also known as vanity so pride is the first deadly sin or defect Envy is the desire for others, traits, status, abilities or situation. Gluttony, the third one, is an inordinate desire to consume more than, one, than, more than that which one requires. Lust is an inordinate craving for the pleasures of the body. Anger is manifested in the individual who spurns love and opts instead for fury. It is also known as wrath, wrath or wrath. Sloth is the avoidance of physical or spiritual work. And the opposite, if you like, the seven contrary virtues. Humility, kindness, abstinence, chastity, patience, liberality, diligence. And the contrary virtues were derived from the battle for uh, the, the poem, an epic poem written by Prudentius, circa 410 AD. An epic poem written... Practicing these virtues is alleged to protect one against temptation toward the seven deadly sins. Humility against pride, kindness against envy, abstinence against gluttony, 
chastity against lust, patience against anger, liberality against greed, and diligence against sloth. So, very black and white, you're either one or the other. But in real life, what are we? We're all of those things at different times in our lives. And although the seven deadly sins and the seven virtues may sound quite old-fashioned, we all have some sort of traits around those issues. And the twelve steps of the fellowship try to address this in, in the way I understand it in step six and step seven so step six is all about my defects of character and step seven is all about my shortcomings so my defects of character are the sins and my shortcomings are not enough of the virtues short on virtue but in there somewhere is modern life and life as it is today and the changing values of society but around that is a personal code so these twelve steps principles these 12 steps are about developing our own personal code of living and how we do that is entirely up to us no one's going to stop us doing it another way and if they were trying to stop us our sins or deadly sins of pride would get in the way we get stubborn and defiant often or I did so step 6 in the fellowship program reads as this with a bit of commentary from me and don't forget this is just a personal understanding it's your understanding in the end which counts and where do you get your personal understanding from life and also listening to the many voices in society and probably in the fellowship of AA if you stick around long enough so we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character this is the step that separates the men from the boys or the women from the girls. So de declares a well-loved clergyman who happens to be one of AA's greatest friends. He goes on to explain that any person capable of enough willingness and honesty to try repeatedly step six yes he goes on to explain that any person capable of enough willingness and honesty to try repeatedly step six on all his, his faults without any reservations whatever has indeed come a long way spiritually and is therefore entitled to be called a man who is sincerely trying to grow in the image and likeness of his own creator and again don't get hung up on creator it's the God of your understanding or a power greater than you which counts in this the common good often is used or utilized of course, the often disputed question of whether God can and will under certain, certain conditions remove defects of character will be answered with a prompt affirmative by almost any AA member. To him, this proposition will be no theory at all. It will be just about the largest fact in his life. He will usually offer his proof in a statement like this. Sure, I was beaten, absolutely licked. My own willpower just wouldn't work on alcohol change of scene, the best efforts of family, friends, doctors and clergymen got no place with my alcoholism. I simply couldn't stop drinking and no human being could seem to do the job for me. But when I became willing to clean house, that's step four, and then asked a, a higher power, God as I understand him, to give me release, my obsessions to drink vanished. It was lifted right out of me. Well, it didn't quite work that way because I was a stubborn son of a gun and I thought I knew better for a long time. But when I got to fellowship, I found there were a lot of people who had given up on pride and said self-will will run riot and willpower will fail. And it was right. So I listened to the many voices. If God works through people, the wisdom came quick and easy for me. So I stuck around for quite a while, shivering, with, with fear another one of my defects until I could keep on listening to what was working for other people and then I started to learn in AA meetings all over the world statements just like this are heard daily it is plain for everybody to see that each sober AA member has been granted a release from this very obstinate and potentially fatal obsession so in a very complete and literal way all AAs have become entirely ready 
to have God remove the mania for alcohol from their lives and God has proceeded to do exactly that and I would add to that as long as I keep on asking for help on a daily basis and listening and learning from others how to live life beyond, beyond just stopping drinking then my defects of character seem to diminish personality traits don't go away completely they just don't but if we ask on a daily basis at least we have a, a good chance that we will operate more to our virtues than our defects when men and women pour so much alcohol into themselves that they destroy their lives they commit a most unnatural act defying their instinctive desire for self-preservation they seem bent upon self-destruction they work against their, best, their own deepest instinct as they are humbled by the terrific beating administered by alcohol the grace of God can enter them and expel their obsession and uh, I guess the grace of God for me is keeping on learning and as it says humility kindness, abstinence, chastity, patience liber liberality and diligence so working on sober rather than working on the next drink here their powerful instinct to live can cooperate fully with their creator's desires to give them new life for nature and God alike abhor suicide but most of our other difficulties don't fall under such a category at all every normal person wants for example to eat, to repro reproduce, to be somebody in society in the society of his fellows and he wishes to be reasonably safe and secure as he tries to attain these things indeed God made him that way he did not design man to destroy himself by alcohol but he did give, him, give man instincts to help him stay alive it is nowhere evidence evident at least in this life that our creator expects us to fully eliminate our instinctive drives indeed that would be foolish to think that so far as we know it is nowhere on record that God has completely removed from any human being all his natural drives indeed that would be unnatural since most of us are born with an abundance of natural desires it isn't strange that we often let these far exceed their intended purpose and that's to do with our thinking and, and our vices I guess when they drive us blindly or we willfully demand that they supply us with more satisfactions or pleasures than are possible or due to us that is the point at which we depart from the degree of perfection that God wishes for us here on earth or as nature intended that is the measure of our character defects or if you wish our sins if we ask God will certainly forgive all our derelictions but in no case does he render us as white as snow and keep us that way without our co cooperation that is something we are supposed to be willing to work towards ourselves he asks only that we try as best we know how to make progress in the building of character so indeed it is about building of character and if we think about our youth where all our instincts and drives and desires were out of control as we came into adulthood and then we find that we had to live in a society where we had to live to the norms and of course drink is not one of them to excess and then addiction but of course every other behaviour can be in that addiction too as many have found so step six we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character is AA's way of stating the best possible attitude one can take in order to make a beginning on this lifetime job in other words to find balance in our natural drives and living so that we can be included in society this does not mean that we expect all of our char yes, character defects to be lifted out of us as the drive to drink was a few of them may be but with most of them we shall have to be content with patient improvement and that's the game progress not perfect because if we try to be perfect from day one we would fail we, we would be back on pride and self will the key words entirely ready underline the fact that we want to aim at the very best we know or can learn how many of us have this degree of readiness in an absolute sense practically nobody has it the best we can do with all honesty that, can, that we can summon is to try to have it even then the best of us will discover to our dismay 
that there is always a sticking point, a point at which we say, no, I can't give this up yet. And we should often tread on even more dangerous ground when we cry, this I will never give up. Such is the power of our instincts to overreach themselves. No matter how far we have progressed, desires will always be found which oppose the grace of God, or, as some say, nature and providence, as we've got to where we are in our nature, and providence, that is, as the world is today. Some who feel they have done the well may dispute this, so let's try to think about it a little further. Practically everybody wishes to be rid of his most glaring and destructive handicaps. No one wants to be so proud that he is scorned as a braggart, nor so greedy that he is labelled a thief. No one wants to be angry enough to murder, lustful enough to rape, gluttonous enough to ruin his health. No one wants to be agonised by the chronic pain of envy, or to be paralysed by sloth. Of course, most human beings don't suffer these defects at, defects at these rock-bottom levels. We who have escaped these extremes are apt to congratulate ourselves. Yet can we? After all, hasn't it been self-interest, pure and simple, that has enabled us, most of us to escape? Not much spiritual effort is involved in avoiding excesses which will bring us punishment anyway. But when we face up to the less violent aspects of these very same defects, then where do we stand? And this is where it's about you and your, you and your understanding of life however it turns out to be. What we must recognise now is that we exalt in some of our defects. We really love them. Who, for example, doesn't like to feel just a little superior to the next fellow, or even quite a lot superior? Isn't it true that we like to let greed masquerade as ambition? To think of liking lust seems impossible. But how many men and women speak love with their lips and believe what they say? so that they can hide lust in a dark corner of their minds. And even while staying within conventional bounds, many people have to admit that their imaginary sex excursions are apt to be all dressed up as dreams of romance. Indeed, we can talk ourselves into anything. I know this. I've done it. Self-righteous anger also can be very enjoyable. In a perverse way, we can actually take satisfaction from the fact that many people annoy us for it brings a comfortable feeling of superiority. Gossip barbed with our anger, and I'm right, I'm smiling there, because it's very easy to become self-righteous in recovery. I mean, the simple answer is, the more self-righteous we are, the more we are dogmatic, the more we are stubborn and defiant about something we believe there is one path, and it happens to be mine. And what I've learned in recovery, my path, if I stick with it defiantly and stubbornly, I'll start to stumble and fall down pretty darn quickly because I need the input and in inclusion of everyone in my life. Gossip barred with our anger, a polite form of murder by character assassination, has its satisfactions for us too. Here we are not trying to help those we criticise, we are trying to proclaim our own righteousness. and. Uh, <coughs> I know this from things which have happened today. Self-righteousness doesn't do me or anybody else any good. But if you point it out to another person that they're being self-righteous, am I not also being self-righteous? Because I'm developing the argument. So sometimes uh, in the fellowship we say, desist of pen and tongue, because there is nothing to add and nothing to be gained by it. Even though we like to do it, and to an extent I can do it too, even now. And then I think to myself, I must laugh at myself and stop it, because I don't know what is right for you. And if I don't know what's right for you, how do I know what's right for me? Which is why I always say I need to keep on learning. When gluttony is less than ruinous, we have a milder word for that too. We call it taking our comfort. We live in a world riddled with envy, to a greater or lesser degree. Everybody is infected with it. From this defect we must surely get a warped yet definite satisfaction, else why would we consume such great amounts of time wishing for what we have not, rather than working for it, or angrily looking for attributes we shall never have, instead of adjusting to the fact and accepting it? And how often we work hard with no better motive than to be secure and slothful later on. Only we call, it, only we call that retiring. 
Consider too our talent for pr procrastination, which is really slow through five syllables. Nearly anyone could make a good list of, the, of such defects as these, and few of us would, be se would seriously think of giving them up, at least until they cause us excessive misery. And without a doubt, if we go hell for leather in one direction, thinking we're right, and we wonder why nobody's following us, we do get somewhat alienated and, and messed up. But if we don't stop giving up those ideas that we're always right, or that my way or the highway is the right way, then we are alone again and isolated. And we, we may not drink, but we're certainly not as sober as we could be. Some people, of course, may conclude that they are indeed ready to have all such defects taken from them, but even these people, if they construct a list of still milder defects, will be obliged to admit that they prefer to hang on to some of them. Therefore it seems plain that few of us can quickly or easily become ready to aim at spiritual and moral perfection. We want to settle for only as much perfection as, it will, as will get us by in life, according, of course, to our various and sundry ideas of what will get us by. So the difference between the boys and the men is the difference between striving for a self-determined objective and for the per perfect objective which is God, of God. Yeah, so we progress and are not perfect. We realise some of our potential, but our defects of character will get in the way if they remain out of balance and we hang on to them. Many, many will ask at once ask, how can we accept the entire implication of step six? Why? That is perfection. This sounds like a hard question, but practically speaking, it isn't. Only step one, where we made the 100% admission, we were powerless over alcohol, can be practiced with absolute perfection. The remaining 11 steps state perfect ideals. So, perfect ideals. So, strict adherence to the steps is about perfect ideals. But, you know, strict adherence on a daily basis, life is happening around us and we're going to be pushed and pulled in all sorts of ways. So, defects, as well as virtues will be around. There are goals towards which we look and the measuring sticks by which we estimate our progress. Seen in this light, step six is still difficult but not at all impossible. The only urgent thing is that we make a beginning and keep trying. And that's it. We make a beginning and keep trying. So contingent on the day we ask for help and refocus ourselves around the virtues Humility, kindness, abstinence, chastity, patience, liberality and diligence. We are on a better wicket, if you like, if you're a cricketer. If we would gain any real advantage in the use of this step on problems other than alcohol, we shall need to make a brand new venture into open-mindedness. We shall need to raise our eyes towards perfection and be ready to walk in that direction. It will seldom matter how haltingly we walk the only question will be, are we ready? So, contingent on the day we ask, are we ready to let go righteousness and every other excessive, excessive outlook or personality trait? Are we ready? And the only answer is, yes, really. Or, if, you're, if we are stubborn and, and defiant and angry, the answer may be no. So we keep on trying. Looking again at those defects we are still unwilling to give up, we ought to erase the hard and fast lines that we have drawn. Perhaps we shall be obliged in some cases still to say, this I cannot give up yet. But we should not say to ourselves that I will never give up. Let's dispose of what happen appears to be a hazardous open end we have left. It is suggested that we ought to become entirely willing to aim towards perfection. We know that some delay, however, might be pardoned, that word in the mind of a rationalising alcoholic could, con could certainly be given a long-term meaning. He could say, how very easy, sure, I'll head towards perfection, but I'm certainly not going to hurry. Maybe I can postpone dealing with some of my problems indefinitely. Of course, this won't do. Such a bluffing of oneself will have to go the way of many another pleasant rationalisation. 
At the very least, we shall have to come to grips with some of our worst character defects and take action towards their removal as quickly as possible. Well, complete understanding that defects of character can come up in any moment of the day if we are provoked or we provoke others. The moment we say no never, our minds close against the grace of God or common sense. After all, what else would God's words be beyond common sense and wisdom for the common man? We're not talking rocket science here, we're talking common sense. Delay is dangerous, and rebellion may be fatal. This is the exact point at which we abandon limited objective and move towards God's will for us, as nature intended, nature and providence. All these wonderful words I like because, you know, spiritual is now. Spiritual is in the moment. It's not tomorrow and it's not yesterday. Although every experience we've had brings us to this spiritual moment of now. And either we accept life on life's terms, acceptance is the key always, or we get into trouble again. And it's being defiant or angry against our situation often, that life isn't giving us what we think we deserve. So just a reminder, the contrary virtues were derived as follows. Yeah. Humility against pride. Kindness against envy. Abstinence against gluttony chastity against lust, patience against anger, liberality against greed, and diligence against sloth. And step six, the seven deadly sins or removal of them, is subject to asking on a daily basis, how am I going to live today? How do I want to behave? How do I want to be open, honest and willing to change my attitude and behaviour to fit my circumstances? And do my feelings fit my life right now? If we've been good in our step four, life story, and expressed it and shared it with another human being and to our creator as we choose, then step six defects fall out of that life story quite easily. And also our shortcomings, the virtues, which is all about step seven. I don't know that we can take six and seven in isolation. I can have a step six day full of defects of character if I'm stubborn and defiant and go back to my old behaviour. Or I can have a better day with a bit of courage, faith, confidence around humility, kindness, abstinence, chastity, patience, liberality and diligence. And I'm a slow learner and often have been a poor student in the past. I was criticised deeply by someone when they, I said I was a poor student in the past or I could be a poor student and it was pounced upon as a defect. It's a defect to keep on point, pointing it out. My defect would be not to say it, if you get my drift. So these are my views and understandings of step, step six and seven. So how does it work for me on a daily basis? Well, in the morning I say, how am I feeling, why, and what can I do? And if I feel okay, given my current situation, my feelings fit my, my experience right now, then life is understandable and comprehensible. I can, I can get on with it. But if my feelings don't fit my current reality, my feelings are over the top in some way, in a particular direction of those defects or sins, or my virtues are without foundation, courage, faith and confidence, over elated. I need to to ask myself, why am I feeling this way? And that's not to actually analyse to death. How am I feeling, why and what can I do is a very great starting point. I don't know how I feel right now. Why? Because I'm giving it, I haven't given it a second thought. What can I do? Consider my options today. Or if I wake up angry, fearful, resentful, or just feeling like I can't cope or I don't know what to do, then I need a bit more courage, faith and confidence and I often get that by ringing somebody up or making contact with another human being not necessarily in fellowship but somebody who I love and loves me back and that's unconditional love it's not dependent on anything else other than love to and from people who care something my father said 
he wished he had cherished my mother more and been less superficial and indifferent and I think that sums it up cherish always and less superficial and less indifferent and the only way I can be that way is to understand my own life and how I relate to other people so the steps work for me daily because in mind and in meditation it's about what is the next right thing for everyone inclusively and not just me so I'm merely a player and I'm not the chief critic anymore I hope although I will be chief critic in my own life often and sometimes flail at others and be critical but it does me no good and it does them no good step six June step seven July I can have a bit of both in each day I can have a, a fairly bad start or a fairly good start enough courage, faith and confidence to keep on going or I could have fear very facing an ego in my heart it's as life is and it's often better if I talk to another human being or get to a fellowship meeting where I can see what is working for others so I can join in and be a part of again freedom to choose life life on life's terms always a unique and authentic path for each person and in fellowship with one similarity a desire to be sober today the serenity prayer is where I finish all my videos hopefully to do with recovery without the screeching of the police cars going past on gracious me a typical London night where I live Anyway, serenity prayer, yes, I even sleep through all of that during the night, often, and then get told about it by my neighbours. So to God, or in good conscience, the serenity prayer is as follows. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference for me is just for today.